Is it, is it going now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Tom, let me, let me uh, remind you before we get started. If, if, uh, if I ask a question, uh, kind of restate the question in your, in your response because my, my rambler is not going to be on this when it's ultimately edited. It's going to be you uh, talking about okay. your experiences, okay? I'll do that. Why don't you start off for me, uh, Tom, and just uh, tell the folks where you're from, how you got there, who your folks are, what your family situation is. I was born in San Antonio in the Knicks Hospital, December 26, 1935. Grew up in uh, West San Antonio. My father became an assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District in uh, 42. They wouldn't take him in the Army because he had a hearing deficiency. He served as a Democrat appointee under Roosevelt, and uh, when it appeared that Dewey was going to beat Truman, Dad took an offer to go into law practice in Brownsville. So we moved to Brownsville January 6th of 46. And that's, I finished public schools there, and then uh, I went to Brownsville, what is now University of Texas at Brownsville, and took uh, two semesters in the summer. I went to Korea, I spent 16 months in Korea, and then I came back and I uh, finished my undergraduate degree at Texas, and then I went to law school in 1960 and graduated in 63. So that's fundamentally takes me through my education. On, on September 1 of 63, uh, my father took the oath to be the valley judge on the newly created 13th Court of Appeals in Corpus. So I had taken the bar in June, but knew the grade wouldn't come back till September. When my bar grade came back on September 8th, I went to Corpus and he swore me in. So I was licensed on September 17, 1963, which ironically is Constitution Day. So in history, three quarters of the states adopted our current Constitution on that day in history. Uh, I went into private law practice in Brownsville with one of his former partners, Mr. Hardy, Ben Hardy. My ears are ringing or something. Anyway, and started law practice there. I was sworn in on a Thursday. Ronaldo Garza, who had been appointed by Kennedy, John Kennedy, to be a federal district judge, in uh, January 61, appointed me to represent a four-time loser in a marijuana case the following Monday. So I tried my first criminal case in federal court the first week I practiced law. How did you get ready for that? Well, needless to say, I read the rules of evidence kind of carefully, and I knew Miranda backwards I knew that if, it, if the guy wasn't caught at a crossing, that he, he was inland, I knew they had to give him the Miranda warning, and I also knew that they had to give it to him in Spanish, and they didn't. So I, I won, it was four count indictment, I won three of the counts. That's the way I got started. You said your dad was uh, sworn in as as a judge of the new 13th court. Yes. <clears throat> that was before you were uh, uh, admitted to the bar, right? 
That's correct. I graduated in May of 63. I went to a legal medical seminar in Colorado. My father called me the week after July 4th and said, you're not going to get to practice law with me. I thought, oh my God, the bar grade came out flawed, which wasn't true. <clears throat> John Conley at that time was a, was a Democrat, and my father had been a yellow dog Democrat, as you might know. And he had asked Dad to serve as the Valley Judge, Paul Nye, the Corpus Judge, and H.P. Green, Victoria, as the Northern representative. So I went to the swearing in, but and it was beautiful, but that, that caused me to want him to swear me in. Uh, if that, that's interesting, the way that, that occurred. I'm sure, and of course I know your relationship with your father, it was a classic father-son relationship. I know that you, you had to have been disappointed that you couldn't practice law with you. Well, I, you know, I talked to John Conley later at a meeting here in San Antonio. I thanked him for doing that. And the reason I did was I got to make my own decisions. I didn't have daddy saying, don't do this, don't do that. I got to do it on my own. My law partner was an admiralty lawyer, and criminal law to him was some fantasy on the moon. So anyway, I got to make my own decisions. Uh, and that helped me. See, I had all the notes. When he took the bar examination, I had all of his notes and all the notes he made in the U.S. Attorney's Office when he was right down the street here. All these notes were very finite in, in criminal law and criminal procedure. Of course, I read all those rather diligently. Uh, my dad told me, he says, you know, I had a case in San Antonio. It was an alleged smuggling and distribution case of marijuana. And uh, it was under the old law prior to 1971. And my dad went up to the U.S. attorney here who was prosecuting and took him to the library and showed him my father's notes in the book that you can't prosecute this under this theory. And he won the case. Where did you go to law school? University of Texas. And were you, tell me about your, your immediate family. Your, uh, when were you married? And <laughs> I got married three weeks before I started law school. I worked in the Texas State Bank there on Guadalupe and my wife worked in the Humanities Research Center next to the tower. Uh, of course, I'd worked in hospitals as an undergraduate, and banking was a little different from working in surgery. Uh, but I worked in the bank the whole time I was in law school, went to law school in the morning, went to the bank in the afternoon. Uh, I had wonderful professors. Charles Allen Wright, who was later Nixon's lawyer, Mr. Stumberg, uh, Gus Hodges, uh, uh, Fritz in the Mexican relation. Uh, every one of the guys I took, Wayne Thode, civil procedure. Uh, every one of the persons I took the key courses from had written a book, or more than a book, so I was lucky. Tell me about your children. <laughs> well, we were very careful. When I say this, I don't mean it. <laughs> it is a joke. Uh, I was, the first three years we were married, I was in law school. It's hard to make babies when you're in law school, particularly when you're both working. My oldest son, John Carlisle, was born December 7, 1965. And uh, he went to Rice University 
and obtained his master's in composition. And then he went to Boston University and obtained his doctorate in composition with honors. And he had been very successful as a composer and uh, the piece he wrote called Music of the Storm for an orchestra and a choir, 150 voice choir, uh, was presented in the Kennedy Concert Hall in Washington, D.C., April 28th. Very successful. It goes around the world, and all they do is play, play music that he wrote. My middle son uh, also went to Rice University. Uh, he is a major in the Air Force. He does intelligence work. Speaks English, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, and Yiddish. Yiddish. Went to language school at Fort Ord and uh, has served in Greece, Saudi Arabia, England, and Korea. And in between England and Korea, he was the commandant of the Air Force ROTC for one year at Texas A&M University. My youngest son uh, has been the national representative for Trek Racing Bicycle Company in the past, and he's also in the real estate business in Colorado. He lives in Broomfield, which is a very nice new subdivision northwest of Denver. He graduated from the University of Colorado. So that's, and I have an 18-year-old daughter, not by my first marriage, and she's 18, and she just graduated from high school. And as a present for her being so diligent, being an honor student, I bought her a car. I had promised her that when she was 15, but she didn't have a driver's license. <laughs> so that's, that pretty well sums it up. Let me go back at least to some specific times that I remember about you and your practice as a criminal defense lawyer. Uh, you had a, had a uh, relationship with Percy Warren. Yes, I did. Tell me about your relationship with Percy Warren. Well, it was, I want to say that Percy and I knew each other long before I, li I was licensed. <clears throat> we had a bunch of ASCS fraud cases that Percy had hired my dad in. In Brazoria County, well, there's 17 counties in the state that grow rice, and these were rice allotments. And the allegations were that the managers of those offices were selling allotments that weren't appropriated for the program. So Dad and uh, Percy were trying uh, the uh, cases, and we got a mistrial because of the Jinx Act violation by the federal government in Galveston. And we got ready to retry it. Well, that was when my dad had already gone on the bench. So I kind of inherited that case as well as another one, which was uh, against a different office manager and Sam Lee, the former DA in Missouri County, Angleton hired me on that because I was working with Percy on the companion case. Then we had uh, a series of cases that involved Charles Harrells. The allegations that Angleton for killing Berg, Alan Berg, were that a fellow named Frank B. Maria hired Harrelson to kill Berg. D. Maria never was tried. That was a not guilty. What was key there is Harrelson was living with a woman called Sandra Sue Attaway. Our claim was she was his common law wife. And at that time, of course, there had been a prohibition. I did all the briefing in that case, 
I had every state's leading cases on the prohibition of a common law wife testifying against her husband, except for some domestic violence between them. And uh, we were well prepared on that one, and I was not guilty. We also had an alibi witness, the county judge of Trinity County, on the day that Judge Hardy held them to, it wasn't on or about. They knew a specific date he was missing. The coroner said he died on that day, and on that day, Harrelson was in Trinity County selling a horse. So then we had the Scamardo case, again with Percy, and that was in the valley, in, in Hidalgo County is where they found his body. I did all the witness investigation of everyone local, and we were able to create an alibi for him based on the timetable. We put him somewhere in a Holiday Inn talking to a beautiful singer when they say the murder occurred. But before that, we had to try the accomplice. This Camardo hired Harrelson to kill his business partner, allegedly for insurance money. Well, that's, that trial lasted from January 17th to April 15th of 1970. And we wanted to try Harrelson first because we had an alibi in that case, but Oscar McGinnis wouldn't. And the family, they wanted Scamargo. Uh, we had a woman that was pregnant and she was selected on the jury. And I thought, as long as they uh, were out, that she'd probably have that baby in the courtroom. But uh, she was still pregnant. They came back for their verdict of guilty and on punishment, they gave them seven years probation. Which was a winner. Which was a winner. Then they tried to revoke Scamardo's probation. And we had a hearing. And uh, the district judge revoked it, but it was reversed and rendered by the Court of, Appeal, Court of Criminal Appeal. So uh, after we got a mistrial on that case. No, we got a seven, the seven years probation. Then we had Harrelson tried for the same offense that Scamardo allegedly hired him for. That was a hung jury. We changed venue from Hidalgo County to Brownsville. And we tried that case before Judge Hester, who was a law and order judge. Jury gave him 15 years. McGinnis had withdrawn the death penalty because the Adams case had come down and God, it would have taken us forever to get a jury. Got 15 years, went to sentencing. The judge would give him the five year credit for the time he had served. We took that up on appeal. Judge Morrison wrote the opinion and uh, says the district judge apparently doesn't realize that it's mandatory. It's mandatory that he gets the credit. So, he was eligible for parole, you know, once he got that credit. He was re released September 1 of 78, and he was arrested at Van Horn, Texas on September 1 of 80. Possession of a weapon by a felon, uh, cocaine, and he stopped to get gas, and he's, he's driving Virginia Ferris Mustang. And he apparently is pretty high. He's going west on I-10. And after he leaves the gas station where he fills up, the attendant called DPS and said, there's a kind of crazy guy and he's going west in a Mustang and I saw a, a pistol on the seat. Well, Harrelson goes about four miles and he doesn't like the way the mufflers sound. So he pulls over on the side of the road and he takes his gun He goes back there and he's going to shoot the muffler off. But he shoots the left rear tire flat. So he's stuck there and then here come DPS and he was arrested there. So uh, uh, 
Judge Wood was killed May 29th of 79, and uh, no one was indicted till April 15th of 82. Judge Sessions, who of course later became FBI director, had his magistrate call me, said, look, you've done such a good job for Harrelson in the state cases, we want to appoint you to represent Harrelson. Well, under the Criminal Justice Act, at that time, knowing it would be a long trial, they could never compensate me for my work if my maximum recovery was $2,000 and $100 for an investigator. So I said, no, I, I can't do that. But if I could talk to Judge Sessions in person, and explain why, what we can do to make it happen. So I went up the next Tuesday, sat down in his office, and we worked out the compensation. And it was at the same rate, 25 and 50, 25 dollars an hour out, 50 in court. But uh, they would let me apply the two weeks. So it had to go from Judge Sessions approving it to Chief Justice Clark of the Fifth Circuit, then they had to go to the pay window in Washington. So, as a result of that, I was adequately compensated for all the work the government paid. Sometimes they cut me a little bit, so. How long did that, did you, did you actually go to trial? Yes. How long did that trial last? It lasted from well, we kind of merged the last pretrial into the trial. We started testimony either the last week of August of 82 or the first week of September. That's, that was where we had live witness. We walked out of the courthouse on December 15th of 82. What was the result? The result at that time was all defendants were found guilty. Now, there was a separation, a severance of Jimmy Chagra from the case. Joe Chagra agreed to testify against Harrelson, but he would not testify against his brother. So Jimmy Chagra, represented by Oscar Goodman's case, was transferred to Florida. And he later was tried and found not guilty. Miss Harrelson is the actor Woody Harrelson's father, is that correct? That's correct. I mean, he, the, uh, the, there were three children born of that marriage. Harrelson. Harrelson. Har and Diane Harrelson, and his, his uh, wife was a former secretary at Baker and Box Law Firm in Houston. She divorced him in 67 and moved the boys to Lebanon, Ohio. Uh, so they never knew Charles as a father. I looked at the divorce decree, he's supposed to pay $50 a month per child, and I find no evidence that he ever did that either. <laughs> so. Tell us why you became a criminal defense lawyer. Well, It was, some of it's historical. Uh, I used to spend time in that courthouse down the street when my dad was the U.S. attorney. I would read law books. Uh, I sat in on the case that Percy and my dad won in the Supreme Court of the United States, the United States versus George Parr et al which was the first time the Supreme Court had ever reversed a mail fraud case. Uh, I sat through, I come back to Korea, I sat through the last trial. There were two missed trials and final trial. So I got interested in it early. Uh, Percy was a showman, but he had a landlocked memory. You tell him something once, never forget. And he said, well, you told me that six days ago. 
was the right thing. Yeah, very, very, very articulate. Uh, my ability to work with him when my father went on the bench enhanced my interest in criminal law. And uh, that's when I started doing research and writing the various articles that had been published in The Voice and in various other journals. I just got real, I just was interested in protecting the rights of people that I knew could protect themselves. And the best, I guess you could say the best feeling I had, uh, I got appointed in the case, people dirt poor, and I spent all the money, all my time, and I won it on appeal because the district judge kind of messed up. And Judge Green was on that panel in Carpus. And, he, and he, of course, I didn't know what the opinion was going to say at that time. But when I finished my oral argument, he says, I want, I want to condemn, commend you for spending all this time to do justice for this woman. And I won. So I kind of grabbed a hold of, you know, in Brownsville, you may get a federal case one day, you may get a state case, you may get. Uh, something that's kind of hybrid, like uh, money laundering. And I won the only money laundering case that's been tried in Brownsville for a jury. And I won the one here in San Antonio that Judge Buck tried involving the Stone Oak Bank and the Herb Pounds. And the article I, that I wrote out of that case had been published in The Voice. Now, I don't want to say I don't do any civil practice, because I do. I was general counsel for Alamo Bank. Right after we won the Harrelson case, they hired me as their general counsel. I, I, don't, know, I don't think it was because the directors planned to kill anybody, but I was hired, their, I bought stock, and I was their general, and sat on the board. Uh, I represent a lot of people who have small businesses, and the key to those businesses is every day that they send something to Mexico or obtain something from Mexico, be it some vehicle or whatever, I've had to give them a, a, war, a warning sheet, which is basically like a caveat. You can do this, but you can't do this to keep from getting exposed out of negligence to some criminal matter. And, uh, you know, the Valley, it's, it's, I've tried cases in J.P. Court. Of course, been to, went one in the Supreme Court, but uh, I just, I enjoy what I'm doing. Tell me about your first experiences with TCDLA. What's your first memory of TCDLA? Well, I was there. <laughs> we used to have the meeting, well, after we formed it, we used to have the meetings with the state bar at the same time, but we don't do that anymore. We were in a hotel room in July of 61 in Dallas during the bar convention. Emmett Colvin, Frank Maloney, Tony Frelo, Percy Foreman, uh, July 71. 71, excuse me, yeah. Uh, Charlie Tesmer, Phil Burleson, and myself. We sat down in the room. And the movers at that time were uh, Maloney, primarily, and Freelo. And Frank was so adamant about getting us formed that he, he was the first president. And then Frito was the second. Uh, we all acknowledged at that time we had no way to have any real effect on the legislature without an association of lawyers representing all 254 counties of the state with a office in Austin, and that we had to get into the education business because you had, uh, 
you were four years away from the Supreme Court approving all these advanced courses for the various specialties. We had to get into educating younger lawyers because most of the things we have seen, and you probably still see some of it, is the mistakes that young lawyers make by opening doors and evidence or whatever, which harms you know the general public. Every defendant is the general public. So uh, we voted, and then of course uh, we went out. Uh, George Luquette, uh, David Evans, all of us, and we all went out and we started signing up people as charter members. Pat Priest, even here at District Court, he says, I was a charter member, and he was proud of it. Well, once we got the nucleus together, then we had to get the financing together. And of course, uh, I haven't been in the new office, but I was present when we bought the previous office. And uh, a lot of that was handled by uh, our district judge in Austin, Bob Jones. And, uh, you know, here we are. You were president in what year were you president? I was the 13th president. I remember, see if you can tell me about this experience. I remember one time, and I forget where we were. Seems like we were in Austin. That's what I, I've got yeah. in my mind. And there was a, a TCBLA meeting and uh, an election going on. And, and how it's generally done historically is with a nominating committee. But I recall. Percy Foreman. Who's there? Making, nominating you, making a, a talk, tell me He about never that. made it. No, he never made it. He See, said. Yeah. What had happened, what happened was procedurally, Emmett Calvin was the nominee. And uh, there was a motion to accept his nomination. There was another, another motion to terminate you know, closed shop on it. And Percy never got to make the speech. Now, about two months after that, I got three letters. One from Freelo, one from Tesma, and one from one of the older lawyers. They said, you know, uh, this, this wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. You know, get Percy to come to anything and make a nominating speech, you, know, you got to have two trucks anyway. Uh, and it wasn't, but you know, I didn't cry and go out of the room crying. I just started over, and then I was, I was the next president. Emmett wrote me a letter. He says, You know, if you had won, that meant I was out of TCDLA. And after that, you know, he did. He came up to Gunnison. Uh, well, you went to my house in Crested Butte. Well, the one I had after that's on the river and got for our seminar we had up there. He gets off the plane and he's got these big round covers for his fishing poles. Came up and we fished together and we talked, we had breakfast together. And ironically, he was had a birthday while he was there. The day before, he had, they hired a helicopter and went out to this uh, Emerald Lake. And he had like 300 little bitty fish. And he had the cook at the Crested View Lodge cook them all for breakfast. And I guess there were 25 people there for, well, that didn't even know him for the seminar. And you know, we had eggs and fish for about two hours. Tell me, tell me about your experience with with uh, Emmett Calvin? Well, I never tried a lawsuit with Emmett, but early on, uh, I think it was 65 or 67, I wrote a bar journal article called Leary, A Black Horse on the Barter. And it was about Timothy Leary coming to Laredo. He already had the marijuana again in New York and, and then being rejected, coming back and being convicted. 
And of course, uh, his case was reversed because if you make an admission to the federal authorities that you have possession of marijuana, once you cross and get to the United States, you're making a prima facie case for the state of possession. And uh, he called me on that and he says, that's a unique title. I said, well, I wanted to get somebody's attention. It wasn't a white horse case. <laughs> now he and Charlie Tesmer have always been friendly. We've always had good experience, but I never tried a lawsuit. What about Freelo, Anthony Freelo? Well, Anthony, before his uh, private practice, was a, was a assistant U.S. attorney in Houston. But he left, he left the office before I was licensed, I believe. Um, of course, Tony Canales uh, was a uh, U.S. attorney, and we always got along well. Uh, you know, I learned early on in the federal court, and I'm going to give you the example. The federal prosecutors don't spend any time researching the law. They just take a statute and try to plug the facts into it. Well, Harry Hall was an assistant U.S. attorney in Brownsville. And this may shock you, young lady. It doesn't, it doesn't require any bad words, but counterfeiters of American money are counterfeiting money in LA. And they hire 28 people that each has a camper, okay? And they give a bunch of this counterfeit money to drive through Mexico and go to Belize. Belize is the first country south of Mexico. And they buy the marijuana with counterfeit American money, okay? And then, of the 28 vehicles, none of them re-enters at the United States at a port of entry that they left from, okay? Well, the first soul that I represented was a passenger in this car. He wasn't a driver, he was a passenger. They got the marijuana a couple hundred pounds out, but he's just a passenger. Well, later, after they got the marijuana out, some soul went over to the storage facility where they could seize the vehicle and took his hand and stuck it up behind the lining for the glove compartment and pulled out about uh, four or five hundred dollars of a counterfeit hundred dollar bill. Well, they charged my guy with that. Well, the U.S. and Judge Hinojosa is pretty smart. And we went to the final pretrial on my motion to dismiss. And uh, Pina Hosa said to Harry, he said, have you briefed this? He says, no. He said, well, Mr. Sharp did. He says, mere possession of counterfeit money is not a federal offense. There has to be some evidence that you've attempted to represent it as money legal tender, or that you pass it to buy goods with, with an implied representation. He said, get the hell out of here. This case is dismissed. And I've also found that that's true with young assistant district attorneys. They don't spend, they've got a, a form of indictment and they fill in the blanks, but they don't spend any time on, on the real elements of the offense and how the hell they're gonna prove. And that's why I think overall I've been successful in keeping people from going to jail because the state, Judge Vela had one, you know, guys down swimming at the beach and there's some little girl out in the surf and the state claims he tried to molest her or something. And we put him on the stand and the judge told the DA, look, Don't be dreaming up theories about how you can prosecute grown men who help little girls out of the water at the beach. Go find something more substantive to do. Other than, other than <coughs> Harrelson, what's your, the, the case that you think of most, uh, 
proudest of the one that two of them here in San Antonio. Uh, the Jaffe's very rich family here have an air, airport business. They redo airplanes for sheiks and or, you know very rich people in the Middle East that about three men ate a coffee and they were indicted by, they were indicted uh, for allegedly violating the election laws of the United States. The theory being that uh, Tony Priscillo came to California, they had a meeting here, and when they did, that all the officers were asked to make a donation. And they did. But at the end of that year, the compensation package for all those officers, they each got a bonus. The government's theory was that it was actually a corporate donation and that they were just being re reimbursed by the corporation for their individual uh, contributions. Well, Judge Bunton tried that one and uh, what the government didn't know, and we brought the chart in, and the secretary and the treasurer, everybody got a bonus. There wasn't any, you know, tit for tat in that case. Everybody got a bonus because they had a huge year, and the jury found them not guilty. Uh, the, the Herb Pounds case, I got a direct, I got a motion for a judgment of acquittal. Granted, here's a bank officer. People come in from Mexico with several million dollars. He fills out the currency transaction reports, but then he calls internal revenue just to be sure. Do I have to fill anything out? No, you got the names, address, yeah, and the amount. So he filled out the proper form, he did his due diligence. Then the people came in and uh, they borrowed money, a loan at Stone Oak Bank against that certificate of deposit. And they represented themselves to be in the tile business and, they, and a trucking company, they had a trucking company and also a breeding company in California, all cattle. But what they didn't tell the, bank, the banker was all this was financed by cocaine, marijuana, and heroin sales. So, the secretary for the corporation, the lady that takes the money to the bank, makes the money, she gets on the stand. And I called Santana, I said, you never met my client, have you? No. You haven't met Mr. Vandersee, the vice president, either, have you? Uh, you wanted the bank to know you were in the tile business, right? You wanted her to know you were in the trucking business, right? And you gave them financial statements all that, right? But you didn't want them to know that you were, all, were also in the cocaine business and also in the heroin and marijuana business. Well, there wasn't any way the government could prove that our client had any notice. Of, they couldn't even prove the source of the money that was in the bank. Well, Judge uh, Bunton granted our motion for judgment of acquittal. And, uh, you know, when you're a banker and you have, the government says you got to fill out these forms if you get more than 10,000 cash and they fill them out, the, the FBI, it's not in the banker's building. You don't have to be researching these people if it appears to be legitimate money. <coughs> oh, I'm really proud of that. <laughs> and the people, there were people crying, and the mother, and the father. You know, it was a, it was a happy day for them. The, you know what the prosecutor did in that case? His name was Jack Frells. Ron Edder was the U.S. attorney. He filed a complaint against Ron Edder, and the essence of it was that Edder signed him to try a lawsuit he couldn't win. And of course, that went nowhere. I could imagine. Yeah. Tell me, uh, Tom, uh, 
what what impact on your practice? What impact on on your life and career as a lawyer has TCDLA had? Well, it's been good for me for multiple of the reasons. I've been able to participate in writing articles that are current, something new that lawyers have never tried, or something new that just cannot came out of a case. Uh, I was I wrote two articles for the, that were published not only by the University of Texas, but for the Voice for the Defense. One of them was predicting dangerousness about the fact that all the Greeks and all these people don't have any training in medical school or otherwise, which would allow them to form an opinion as to the future conduct of anybody. And the other was the uh, all the objections you got to make at the uh, sentencing hearing on that. Uh, it has helped me in that I've had lawyers attend, attend seminars. <coughs> <laughs> and uh, they'll call me. I'll get calls over a period of a year or so about something I either said or something I wrote. I don't pay for advertising, but this is, to me, is, is having an association that functions properly and that helps the public is the best advertising we can have. And uh, as long as we have these seminars and people come to them, particularly the younger lawyers, it's basically a preamble for them because they got to be practicing five years before they take a board certified exam and they have to have current CLE. Of course, the minimum is only 15 hours, but they're going to have to take this course and the advanced criminal course at least once every year while they're board certified. Uh, it's helped me because I've been invited to make speeches to private clubs, koalas, uh, Zonta, Daughters of the Mexican Revolution, I mean American Revolution. <laughs> you know, because it gives you a presence. If you've been president of something, there's just kind of an added incentive for people to listen to you. That's, and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. And, I, and I've made a lot of good friends. You know, I didn't know you. I didn't know anybody outside of those people sitting in that room with me in, in 71 in Dallas. And, you know, good friends. I've had, well, I've, I had them up at Crested Butte. I don't know whether you came to Brownsville when we had it at my home. I just bought that home from the bishop. It was too much of a house. I'm glad you all came and tried to fill it up. Law practice is wonderful if you do it correctly. What advice would you have for young lawyers that are contemplating a career as a criminal defense lawyer? I'd advise that they take an undergraduate, that they take heavy government courses, heavy history courses of the way we got to where we are now, and at least 10 hours of speech and eight hours of philosophy, and just merge all that together, I think, and, and be well prepared to write and speak. Be, when, you know, when they call on you in law school, and, and they did a trick on one of my friends one time. Saturday morning courts, football game, Saturday afternoon. He's been out Friday night and his head's like this on the desk. And we're taking federal tax from Wilkinson. <coughs> and Wilkinson's writing some equation up on the board. And lawyer sitting next to me punches this guy. He called on you. <laughs> the guy says, uh, unprepared. And Wilkins turned around and said, who said that? I did, you yeah, Sir, I did that. He says, well, I didn't call on you, but that's good for the soul. <laughs> I think most, most clients, when they first see you, particularly in a criminal case, and first talk to you, they want you to be real serious. They expect it. 
But they also need to know, they also need to know that you have a sense of humor. Because they get along with you better if they know if you can incorporate something, get something funny out of this situation. Um, I'm hoping that, uh, I've only been practicing law 45 years, but I've, I've been very lucky, and I'll say that truthfully, I've been lucky because I've always been at the right place at the right time to do the right thing. When Percy hired me, I didn't expect that. Uh, when Sam Lee hired me, I didn't expect that. When the Mexican government hired me to, to defend their oil industry, I didn't expect any of that. And the reason I got all those cases is word of mouth. Some Mexican lawyer told somebody that worked for the president, Echavarria, that the best lawyer in Brownsville was Sharp. And that's all they knew. They didn't have my, you know. And just based on one call from the right person to another person, you never know where your cases are going to come from. And I'll give you a perfect example. I represented a guy on five DWI cases. He's a salesman. He worked for a company in Cleveland, Ohio. They sell industrial rags. What do you do with those? You clean the inside of diesel engines with them. Well, the sixth time he calls me, I said, Warren, are you in trouble with logging? No, 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 no. My new employer in Jackson, Tennessee has been sued because the four of us that worked for Cleveland Cotton Products, we went to work for Jackson and they claim we violated some covenant of trade seekers, whatever. And, and of course, he may have been under alcohol and influence, but he's talking to me. And I said, what's the president's name? He told me, give me his telephone number. Because they, they had been sued in Dallas, San Antonio, and Brownsville. Before I called the president of, of their new company at Jackson Bearing, I said, Warren, how many dollars worth of sales have you made in Texas you for since you left Cleveland Cotton Products? He says, 3800000 I said, Rag? He says, no dollars. Well, I got very interested at that point, and I was hired. I spent, I, I spent six different trips going into Memphis Airport, seeing Elvis Presley as big as life in the statue, driving to Jackson. And that client didn't have to pay one penny in damages. Now that wasn't a criminal case, but the point is it was as a result of a criminal case I'd handled well for a guy that was a drunk, and I'd get plugged into his new corporation. Let's kind of sum up uh, where you think the criminal practice goes from here. Well, you know, you've got an election coming up. The uh, Supreme Court of the United States is going to close down next Tuesday. Uh, Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, every year when I wrote and graded the criminal law certification exam, uh, we always tried to change the subject matter. We could ask the same question, but the answer may have changed because of new law, new, new, new case. I think criminal law for the private practitioner, there has to be a lot more concentration on holding the government and the state's feet to the fire. I think there are, and I, I had one recently where the complaint and the information were both signed by the assistant DA, but there was no affidavit. And uh, a lot of people who are not lawyers wouldn't know that's defective, and they'd go in and make a plea. Uh, 
I think we have to pay a lot more attention to the detail of how a case gets in the district attorney's office. And Brownsville is an example. The investigation is handled by the Brownsville Police Department. And they take whatever they have to the DA. And, and Edinburgh is the same way. But criminal law is not going to go any further to keep the government from doing things wrong because we are a peace officer. Not gonna, we're a peace officer and we enforce the law against the state and the federal government. Unless lawyers are willing to kind of sacrifice a lot of time because you're never going to be fully compensated for some of the cases. Uh, it's going to, uh, good prosecution is going to be bad defense every time. Uh, good defense, proper arguments, proper motions, proper uh, in limines, uh, proper, you know, now with the way you qualify experts, uh, we can't have these guys coming off the street, the street saying they're toothbrush experts. And there has to be some standard for that expertise. Uh, one of the cases we won in the Fifth Circuit was based on that. No standard of criminal liability, and that was the Van Lue cases, uh, government versus Caltex. Florida, Texas, and California had agreed on what our juice was, okay? But everybody mixed orange juice, and they sold it as pure orange juice. Well, there was an indictment for adulteration and misbranding, a conviction. There was a separate indictment for perjury based on the testimony in that case, and the Fifth Circuit reversed both cases and rendered them the same day. If there's not a criminal standard for a violation, in other words, if nobody knows what pure orange juice is, you can't have a felony conviction. And the perjury was the same. When these guys testified, they were testifying against the process, about the process, not about the market. Uh, you're gonna get surprised sometimes when you're practicing criminal law. And to keep from having those surprises, I always ask the witnesses, and I always ask the defendant, Will you tell me the truth? If you don't tell me the truth, I cannot help you. If you leave out something which is not fully disclosing all the facts, I can't help you. If you uh, get involved in, in some way in trying to affect the witnesses in this case, I can't help you. You've got to stay away from those. Those witnesses are gonna be adverse to you because you're going to get indicted for <coughs> tampering with a witness. I'll ask you one last question. Yes. If you had it to do all over again, would you do it again? Absolutely. Every, everything. I believe in this association. I believe that good law practice has its rewards. And I believe that... Uh, as long as we have somebody who has a stick and a big stick like Teddy Roosevelt who can kind of shepherd the, the younger people into what criminal law is really about. You know, criminal law many times is not based on fairness. It's not based on uh, some ideal that the system is perfect. Criminal law basically comes down to convincing 12 people that you're sincere, that you believe in your case, and if they don't believe in you, they ain't gonna believe anything you, you ask for the witness stand. You have to be, you have to be sincere with those people. And talk down, don't talk down to them, talk their language, don't use, a word with more than six syllables in. Uh, 
As long as we have the advocacy preserved in our society uh, for criminal lawyers, we can protect ourselves from the government and the state. And, and these people that we represent, they need protection because they may have done something wrong, but not exactly what the government says they did wrong. I have a book in my office, it's famous jury arguments, and I've read every one of them. And of course they're old, but they're very apropos to today. So, is that enough fodder for you? That's good fodder, thank you.